All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. Today, we're talking about legal basics every podcaster should know. So if that's what you're looking for. You're in the right place. If you don't know me, my name is Sunny Galt, and I am the founder and network director of Parents on Demand. If you haven't checked us out yet, please do. You can find us at parentsondemand.com. But we are a network of podcasts specifically geared towards parents and families. So if you're a parent and you're looking for great podcasts, podcasting content out there. We'd love for you to check out our website. We also have some free apps that are available for Apple and Android. So it's very easy to listen to all of our shows through the apps. I recommend you check that out. If you are a podcaster creating content for parents, I would love to chat with you and see if you're a good fit for our network. Real quickly, the things that we focus on for the members of our network, I like to call it MAC for all of you Apple enthusiasts out there. And it stands for Marketing, Advertising, and Community. So so if you're trying to get the word out about your show, need a little bit more exposure, we can help you out with that. Advertising, if you're interested in making some money with your show, but you don't want to deal with all the advertisers, we can help you out with that. And then community, and that is basically having a group of people you can bounce ideas off of, people that are creating similar content to what you're doing, that's community. And we do all of those things. The webinars that we do, like we're doing today, that falls into community too, because we believe we're stronger together and we like to educate our members and uh, and basically just allow you to create the best content you possibly can and we want to help out with that wherever we can so please check us out again parentsondemand.com so my partner in crime today joining us is Gordon Firemark and Gordon and I have known each other for the last couple years I'm sure we'll get to a little bit later in the conversation how we met and the reason behind that uh, but Gordon is an entertainment attorney based out of LA Gordon I'm gonna let you take it away and, and tell everyone everyone else a little bit more about yourself. Okay. Hi, Sonny. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I, I, as you said, I've been practicing entertainment law here in Los Angeles, entertainment and media and uh, digital media and business law, basically, here in Los Angeles. Uh, going on 26 years now, and um, I advise, you know, folks who do all these kinds of media and in the business uh, transactions that they engage in and how to stay out of trouble and that kind of stuff. And so I'm also a podcaster. And uh, I got interested in podcasting early in the days of podcasting by listening to, uh, uh, I, I was a television fan of a guy named Leo Laporte. And uh, he had a, uh, left his television network and started his own podcast called This Week in Tech, Twit. And I was following that and I saw what he was doing and, and thought, oh, that's cool. And then I, out of the blue, got asked to be on a podcast. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm guesting on people's shows. And then I started my <laughs> own. And I realized that there was no one place to go find out what the law is for podcasters and right. in a lot of ways it's very similar to entertainment and other media kinds of stuff so I actually wrote a book and <laughs> <laughs> it all started with a book <laughs> so, uh, so here we are yeah and what's the name of your podcast if people want to check it out so my, I have several shows but the, the primary one is called entertainment law update it's a monthly roundup of legal news and case law uh, updates on the subject. We just recorded an episode yesterday, in fact, and um, uh, we do about an hour discussion, me and a co-host, and um, uh, share with the legal community and uh, the law geeks out there <laughs> the stuff that <laughs> I geek out on. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to discuss in today's webinar, just to give you guys kind of a 30,000 foot view of everything. So we're going to talk about your podcast and when does it become a business? Right? When do you have to start thinking about things like LLCs or filing as a corporation? We're going to talk about intellectual property, and that includes copyrights, trademarks, and patents. What about contracts with co-hosts and guests and vendors that you may be involved with? Personal rights such as defamation, privacy, right of publicity. What do you need to know about all that? As well as rules about advertising. When do you need to let your audience know that what you're putting on your show is an advertisement, an endorsement, or an affiliate of some sort. And then if we have some time at the end, we're gonna to touch a little bit more on privacy and something that the EU is going through. Um, actually, it's gonna take effect at the end of May, but it can impact all of our shows and the way we market and, and promote our show. So if we have some time to that, we're gonna to try to keep this to an hour, um, but if we have a little bit of time at the end, hopefully we can- I was just gonna say we might get everybody into bed on time. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to touch on some of this. We may have to have Gordon back at another time to really dive into some of this if you guys have a lot of questions. Speaking of which, if you do have questions and you are watching live, 
through Zoom, which is the platform we're using, there is a little Q&A button. If you hit that, you can type out a, a question and I'll be checking that as we go through. Uh, again, we may not have a chance to answer a bunch of questions, but at least we know, you know what questions you have and perhaps we can respond on an individual basis. But let's go ahead and dive into this now. And the biggest question, Gordon, I think a lot of podcasters have is, are podcasters held to the same legal standards as other forms of media? Because can, can't we claim that, oh, I'm just podcasting or, oh, this is just a hobby? Or do we really have to be mindful of all of this? Well, whether it's a hobby or not, the laws that apply to creating content and using content really don't change whether you're in business or a hobbyist or whether you're making money or not. So yeah, you you as a podcaster, you are subject to the laws relating to things like copyright infringement and trademark infringement and, you know, if you say the wrong thing about people. So, yeah, it, basically, we hold everybody to the same standard. Now, now, journalists have their own sort of code of ethics that podcasters, you know, may or may not sign on to, but I think that we ought to think of ourselves, even if we're, again, as a hobbyist, not intending to make money or much money out of it, we ought to be thinking of ourselves as journalists and as media creators because that's, in fact, what we are. A lot of people think that it does boil down to whether or not you're making money with something. And so if you're profiting from this, I guess you can define profiting in a bunch of different ways. But monetarily, if you're making money from something, then the laws apply. But that's not what we're saying here. We're saying, listen, even if you're doing this as a hobby, you need to follow the rules. Yeah, uh, it's a common misconception that I'm not making money, so it's okay that I did something. It's just not not the case. It, 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 that that becomes a factor in one analysis of one very small segment of the law. Yeah. Okay. So some people may get into podcasting and just think it's a hobby or, you know, kind of like you, you were on a podcast, you kind of got, you know, interested in it, but they may not be ready to make that step. Or I've heard a lot of stories of people that start their show just as a hobby, thinking that's all it's ever going to be. They get an audience before you know it, things are happening. When do we transition or when is it smart to start thinking about things as a business from the very beginning, just in case, or how does that work? Yeah, this is sort of, uh, it's as much a tax question as it is a legal question, because if you want to be able to deduct the expenses of buying equipment and paying for hosting and those kinds of things, then thinking about it as a business, at least thinking about it as a business is important from the earliest possible day before you start spending that money, yeah. because then you, um, you know, you fill out a, a form Schedule C on your tax return and you can then take that itemized deduction. At least you could under the previous law. I don't know whether under the new tax laws that's actually still available. I, I suspect it is, at least if you form an entity. And so the entity is a corporation or a uh, limited liability company, or there's a few other kinds, but those are the, the main ones to think about. And those entities have a number of advantages if it makes sense financially to do that, you know, forming the entity might cost you, you know, a few hundred to a couple of thousand dollars before the, you know, before you finish doing that. The, the advantages are you can um, be shielded from liability related to your, to the business. Your personal assets aren't on the line. Whereas if you don't have that entity and somebody decides to sue you, say for copyright infringement or defamation or something, they could be looking at making you sell your house in order to pay a judgment or something like that. So if you have personal assets that you want to keep separate uh, and apart from the things that could arise out of the podcast, the entity is a good idea, LLC or corporation. Uh, it's also a great way to, to organize when you have multiple owners. So if you have co-hosts or a, a production team and everybody's sort of owning things in a certain way, you, you divide that up in membership of the company or shares of the corporation and uh, you can do that. And if you need to raise financing from investors or something like that, LLCs are, and corporations allow you to do that more easily and, uh, and again, without exposing your investors to that kind of liability risk. And I know we don't want to go too far in the weeds with all this, but mm -hmm. someone once told me, because I originally filed all my shows as an LLC, because I knew from the beginning that I wanted to pursue 
my podcast as a business. So I, I viewed everything, I think, a little bit differently. And my tax guy at the time told me that, listen, even if you are filed as an LLC, people could still add you to whatever, when we're talking about a lawsuit or whatever, um, they could add you as a person. So therefore you're still not really protected. They could still go after your house because they'll add you, they'll throw in the kitchen sink, you know, whoever they can get on that, you know, to, to blame for whatever happened, they're going to throw you on there. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that's true. I mean, the idea is that if you're able to sort of point fingers and say, Hey, you know, you're supposed to be suing the company. Right. Um, then you can often get out of that lawsuit more quickly when it's pretty clear that the company is responsible for this thing. Yeah, there's no cure from for the you know stupid lawyer tricks of, of <laughs> throw everybody in and, and yeah and see what shakes out. But this is a way of of helping it shake out quickly. Okay, makes sense. Sorry, guys, my dog's barking in the background. Must be my kids. Hmm. All right, so let's talk about um, intellectual property, um, trademarks. Uh, copyrights, patents, things like that. Uh, the first thing that I thought of, and, and someone told me that's gave me some good advice in the very beginning when I was starting my shows. I already had the, the names for my shows and they said, well, have you checked this? No, I hadn't checked it. You know, I just thought it was a cute name. The URL was available. I thought, isn't that all I need to do? So uh, from a content creator standpoint, as we're initially creating our shows, what do we need to know about, you know, the, the content that we're planning, whether it's the show title, a tagline, something like that? Should we be checking all of this? Yeah, well, let me start with a, just an overview of what intellectual property is. It refers sure. to those things you mentioned, copyrights, trademarks, patents. We'll start with patents real quick because we can dispose of it very quickly. Patents are, uh, is, a, is the structure of protection for inventions and processes and certain kinds of designs of systems. And uh, for the most part, that doesn't apply to your average day-to-day -day podcaster. The technology behind it has been the subject of some patent lawsuits over who invented the notion of an RSS feed and things like right. that. That, we don't have to think too much about that. Copyrights protect the, the actual content, and we'll come back to that. But trademarks is what you brought up here in right. terms of the title of your show or the name of a brand or a product. And um, yeah, the, a, a trademark is a word or a symbol or a phrase or some indicia of, of uh, ownership. It's something that's attached to goods or services that says, hey, this is coming from that particular source. And it's sort of, it's a brand right? Uh, just like we used to burn the symbol of, a, of the ranch onto the skin of the cow, a brand. So um, it's something distinctive. A red triangle in the corner of a cracker or cookie box tells you what company that's coming from. I don't have to tell you which you know which one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, and so there are some very powerful brands out there. And yes, you need to be mindful that if you're creating a show about a famous beverage, um, or even if it's not about a famous beverage, but you decide to call it the Coke is it podcast, you're going to have a problem coming from Coca-Cola, even though the domain name was available. Yeah. So you want to check there. But what more often happens is you choose a name that seems like, oh, well, nobody else could possibly want this. And then you find out, well, the domain was available, but somebody else is already running a, you know, a cupcake shop in Nebraska and has a website or something. You know, so they may want to uh, protect their, they may have done something to protect their name. The good news is trademarks um, apply on a category by category basis, depending on the kinds of goods and services. So unless they're also in the entertainment media or sound recording kind of business, uh, a podcast probably doesn't infringe on a cupcake shop. Mm -hmm. But it's the kind of thing you want to know when you're selecting the titles for your shows, that you're not going to be stepping on somebody's toes or, you know, somehow tarnishing their brand's image by your show or vice versa. And how do we search for this? I'm assuming there's online catalogs or libraries that we can do a quick search? Well, you know, cer certainly a Google search is a good start. Uh, you can go to the United States Patent and Trademark Office at uspto.gov and search. They have a, a search feature. It's a little hard to figure out, but you can get in there and, and search for, you know, a phrase or a word and those kinds of things. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good start. But, you know, ultimately, if it's really a, a, going to be a big business, a deep dive, we can, there are services that will search you know, newspapers and, and uh, all the public records around the world, you know, for a few hundred dollars and get a real, usually a fairly thick report of anything that's similar enough that it might be confusing. And it's useful to know that because you don't want that confusion if you can avoid it. 
So as you're talking, I'm thinking, what podcaster is going to do all of this work? I mean, yeah, right? So I kind of still find ourselves in this kind of conundrum where we're like, yeah, we're supposed to do it, but you know, this podcast is bringing in X amount of dollars or perhaps no dollars yet. And we have a full-time job doing something else. We're doing this part-time. So, I mean, what's the takeaway here? I mean, I, we can do a quick Google search, right? That's Right. So don't, the takeaways are two. Don't name your show after something, you know, that it's likely to be confused as to being affiliated with it. His classic example is somebody does a, a, a podcast about a particular television show. This is a very common thing, right? Yeah. Podcaster does a show about a television show or a brand or a product, you know, and the owner of the company, even though it, the title of the show isn't exactly the same as the title of the television program or the brand, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll give the example. It was uh, uh, someone had Once Upon a Time, the television show, yeah. did the Once podcast. Mm -hmm. And they got a little bit of grief from from the TV network over that. It was more about the the font and the way they displayed it in the in the album art. But the, the TV show folks were not happy that it was being too closely as affiliated and indicating that it may be coming from the same producers. And right. the, didn't want the exposure and the and that. So don't name your, your show after something too closely that's going to be confused as to um, whether or not it's endorsed or sponsored by the, the other thing. And on the other side of the coin, when you choose your title for your show, consider registering a trademark. It costs, you know, several hundred dollars to file a registration um, or more, depending on the scope of things. But uh, it's a great way to prevent others from coming in and naming their show in a confusingly similar way. I just recently had a client who had a, she's had a trademark registered for her show title for a number of years and just recently learned someone else started a podcast with a very, almost the exact same uh, title. And then she in searching also discovered a radio show in, um, I think it was the Chicago area or something, radio show of the same title. Hmm. And so we ended up, we didn't end up sending cease and desist letters. She actually sort of politely emailed them and said, listen, I have a trademark. Would you mind changing your title? And both of them said, yes, sure. Of course. I'm sorry. Yeah. That yeah. wouldn't have happened had there not been a registration. Sometimes people just don't know, like, yeah. you know, like we were talking about, they haven't done the research or whatever. And it's very, you know, innocent. Yeah, um, I actually had a, you're on the receiving end of that. Yeah. Wouldn't you rather have known before you chose the oh, title? So course. you should do the search. Yes. And, and this also applies to images. I, I had a situation. Um, I used an online source, a freelance source, you know, where you can hire freelancers to create my artwork for my shows. I, I didn't want to use my own image. I wanted something, you know, that was kind of cutesy and they're kind of like caricatures of parents and stuff like that. And um, I hired someone and it, it was, they did a great job. And it was probably three years after I was into doing my podcast. Podcast, I got an email from someone. She was the sweetest person, super nice. And she said, where did you get your images? And I was like, oh, there's this great person that I hired. I will give you, you know, her contact information. I, Cause I get approached, you know, quite a bit. Like people ask me those kind of questions and she's like, she sent me an email back and is like, she actually took my image. Like, and she showed me a side by side of an image she created and this freelancer, and I don't want to be mean against freelancers. You know, this was a, you know, individual situation. Um, but she was really nice. And I said, Oh my gosh, what do I do? Because I made the freelancer that I hired say this was something she created from scratch. She gave me all the rights. Like I was trying to do everything very legitly. Mm -hmm. And she's like, if you just, you know, this wasn't your fault. She said, just don't work with that person again. Cause obviously she's taking people's stuff. So yeah. she was very nice, but it could have been no take down your stuff or I'm going to take you to whatever court or mm -hmm. lawsuit or whatever right and, and that kind of thing happens all the time i mean yeah. you know bloggers you know have, have known about one company getty images you know throws an, a really nasty letter the very first time they catch an image that wasn't properly licensed and uh you know if even though it was your web designer or someone like that or your your co cover art designer who did it you're still responsible so you do right. need to make you know be vigilant about this it's hard to search images like that but there are some ways um, don't obsess about it, but, you know, just make sure that people understand they have to do original work uh, when yeah. you hire for that yes. kind of stuff. Um, and that's another, that's, so we're into the copyright space now. You know, copyright <laughs> really protects any work of authorship, expression, and so on. So if I, you know, paint a painting, write a poem, record a recording, 
I own a copyright in that from the very moment the, I push the record button. Uh, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go register it, although I can, and it's a good idea. Um, you know, the copyright exists from the moment the work is what we call fixed in tangible form. So once it's recorded or written or drawn or whatever, there's a copyright. And only the author has the right to copy and distribute and, and make things derivative of that, uh, of that work. So when you use someone else's music or a recording of someone else's voice or you know, all these kinds of things, you could be infringing on copyright. So the good news is you own a copyright on your show from the moment you create it, mm -hmm. but anything you bring in that you didn't create could be a risk of, of copyright infringement. Which is tough because as a podcaster, you, you know, I feel like we're talking about music now, right? And that's kind of the big question a lot of podcasters have well, is or, I want to incorporate- snippets, you know, film clips, snippets. And right. Things. It's common. Yes, it is. So, I mean, what, what do we do then as far as do we just, are, are there resources that we can use where it is free if we're trying to do this on a budget, like common use kind of stuff? Or what do you recommend for people that don't have a huge budget to- well, do yeah. this. So there are libraries of music that's free to use uh, under the Creative Commons license, which basically just says you have to give some attribution usually, and you can't do it for commercial purpose. The issue is if you if you create a show that you're going to have sponsors on, are you commercial or not? You know, becomes a question. Uh, or you can buy um, music from what we call a royalty free music libraries, where you just pay one time. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to be very careful that you check the uh, uh, the license terms. Is it one time per episode or one time per year or one time for the whole show? You know, it, it could go any different way. Um, or you hire somebody to create some music for you and, again, pay one time and own it. Right. And, uh, and that's possible. And you need to have the right contract to make sure that you do, in fact, own what they create. It isn't a given that if you pay them, you will own it. You have to have special language in a contract. It's called a work made for hire. Um, and, uh, and there are a few companies now. I know that um, one of the podcast hosting services has just struck a deal with a company that, that um, specializes in music for podcasts and has set up a, a particular kind of licensing structure that, that works pretty well. It's a few hundred bucks, I think, one time and you're done. Really? You, go, you, you can say the name of it. It's okay. Because I, I think a lot remember. of people... I think it's podcastmusic.com or something. Oh, like. okay. It's, it's Blueberry is the hosting company that does that. But, um, but that podcastmusic.com is a separate entity that you can also go directly to and okay. sign up for their library. I think it's an annual subscription or something. And then you can use the music that's in the library. I think that is so smart because this is something that so many podcasters struggle with. And I mean, they get the Rolling Stones or the Beatles. No, no, <laughs> no. But I think we just want something to, you know, entertain yes. people and keep them listening to our show. We're not necessarily going after the latest, greatest on the top 40, right? Um, but it's a big problem. So I'm glad someone is, is coming up with a way around that. Um, the other thing, and we kind of touched on this a little bit, but I want to go back to it. So using sound bites or use the, um, the example earlier of a TV show. So yeah. there's a lot of people out there doing commentary on television and probably movies as well. Do we have any ability to, to use that? I've heard the, the yeah. rule about, oh, well, if it's only three seconds or make up some number, I don't know, then, then you could do it. But if it's past three seconds, you can't use it. Is there any validity to any of that? There is some, there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding it. So let me try to dispel them a little bit. So there's a, there's a principle in copyright. Actually, it's a principle of the first amendment here in the U S free speech that you want to be able to, to use little bits when you're making commentary, you know, for the right social purposes, we want to have, um, we want to lift the restriction on using that stuff. So there's a principle in copyright law called fair use, which takes a, a four factor analysis of whether or not the work um, you know, the alleged infringing work, what's the purpose and character of it? What's the nature of the original thing? Uh, what's the impact on the market? That's where the, the money thing sometimes comes into play. Mm -hmm. And um, how much was taken is a big factor. So all four of those factors have to be weighed independently and there's no rules of thumb. So the idea that it, well, it's only three bars of music or, or four seconds or none of that applies, it really is a case by case analysis of is this a substantial amount of, or, or of the of the core of the thing that you've taken and how does that relate to what, you know, the original and the new thing and, and what does that do to the market? And we have, we have this complicated analysis. The problem with this fair use defense, and that's what it is, it's a defense to a suit for infringement. So you only really get to talk about it 
with the other side in front of a judge after they've filed a lawsuit against you and you've paid tens of thousands of dollars to hire lawyers. And <laughs> so, so that's no fun. No. So don't rely too much on that. Now, the good news is that, you know, criticism like film criticism and television criticism is definitely one of the areas that's recognized as being usually fair use if you're only using a short snippet you know a few seconds from a 30 minute or a 60 minute television show is not a substantial taking yeah um, although 30 seconds of a minute and a half long song might be so that, that's why it's it's a moving target um but you know, if you're doing a, if you use a short snippet from a television show, and then you're talking about that scene of the show and and making some critical judgments about it or whatever, that's probably going to come under fair the fair use as free speech, and that's the idea. But you have to do this analysis for each piece you use, and so it's <laughs> it's tricky and it's a little risky, is what I'm getting from this. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, mean, I don't want to scare people too much. Yeah. Um, most of the time you know, you never hear about it because the the owner of the content, has, you know, feels, well, it doesn't hurt my market and it's just a tiny little bit. And, you know, they do this analysis too. It doesn't make any sense to go sue somebody who can't pay a judgment, um, you know, unless you need to make an example of them because what they're doing is so egregious. Right. I've, I've heard it used in podcasts as well, kind of like how radio hosts use it kind of for emphasis. So if there's a really funny line from a movie or something and, you know, someone says something funny, and they drop in a track. Mm -hmm. Would that fall under this as well? They're not really, it's just used for entertainment purposes. They're not commenting on the movie or anything like that, but it's, it's like something funny that someone said or like a well, weird noise. Like that is a little bit of social commentary. I mean, I think there's an argument to be made. Uh, okay. And again, a, a very short, you know, five word right. um, phrase, use the force Luke or something like that. Yes. We're not <laughs> saying that just now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Want to make sure we're in the clear here. All right, let's move on because I know we got a lot of stuff to get to. Yeah. Contracts. Let's talk about contracts specifically when it comes to um, you You have your show, you want to invite a co-host on, guests that come on your show, release forms. What do we need to know about this? Okay, bottom line it for you. Get it in writing. If if you are doing business, even though you think of it as a hobby, you're doing business with some people. Now, most of the deals you make with your hosts and your, I'm, I'm sorry, your, your hosting service and your, you know, all the online services that we use, we already, we do it. We click a box when we sign up and that's the contract. There is actually a contract there. But when you bring a co-host on, you know, here's the, the, the issue becomes um, when two people get together to do business together, they're considered partners and therefore co-owners. So if that's your intention, fine. But then you get into questions of, well, what are we doing? How do we divide things up in terms of responsibility and financial responsibility as well as profits? And so it pays when you have a co-host or a co-producer of your show to get these things hammered out on paper so there can be no misunderstandings and God forbid there is a dispute later, we can figure it out from looking at the paper. What did you guys agree? What was the intention mm -hmm. of, your, of the parties? So that's for, you know, co-hosts and, and anybody you bring in to do services for you, you want it the other way. You want it clear in writing that they're not an owner. Right. Right. Um, when you do an advertising deal with a sponsor, you want to make sure that you understand what your obligations are and they understand what their obligations are mm -hmm. so that if you ever need to enforce it, you've got proof of what the intention was. So get it in writing. That's the basic. Now, um, when we get into the situation where you're having a guest on your show, I'm, a, I'm a, on a mission. <laughs> My crusade is that people should use a guest release with everybody that comes on their show. If you have somebody on the show who isn't already a part of your team and signed with a contract, they should sign something saying, Yes, I understand that you're recording me and I give you my permission to record it, to use the, the proceeds of the recording, everything that we do to, together, and that I will have no claim and no, you're not gonna, you don't have to pay me and all those kinds of things. So there cannot be any later turning around and pointing fingers. Okay. Um, you, actually, that's how you and I came to know each other. You, now you've given me permission, yes, to, yes. to share a little bit? Okay. Sure. So early in one of your shows, you had a guest on the show who, after a, a sort of change in the editorial direction of your show, uh, objected to some of the other guests and, and points of view that you were sharing on the show and asked you to take down her episode. 
and basically refused to allow you to use her name or, or anything to explain why that episode was now suddenly gone. Mm -hmm. And um, when we sort of resisted and, and pushed back a little bit, she did in fact file a lawsuit against you. Right. So had there been a written release like I'm talking about, I, none of that would have happened in my view. And um, that your case is actually the one that sort of set me off on this crusade. So. <laughs> I was already talking about it. But. <laughs> right, of course, of course. Um, yeah. So uh, how, how official do these need to be, though? Because when I think of contract, I think of legalese. I think mm -hmm. of hiring somebody like you, you know, to make this kind of elaborate because, you know, you just you know, you just don't really know what you don't know. Right. And so I've had people give me contracts mm -hmm. that didn't want to deal with lawyers. That was really more like bullet points, very simple to understand. This is what I'm going to do. This is what you're going to do. This is what we expect to happen. It's for this length of time, super easy, both sign it and we're done. Or, I mean, what are the parameters here? What do we, what do we have well, to Before we get off the subject of those releases, because I just yes. want to let your audience know that on this particular front, they're lucky. There is a free, re I have created a free resource that uh, is, you know, it's my opt-in bribe basically, but you go over to podcastrelease.com and you get a release with a little bit of instructions about how to use it. And, uh, um, you know, I will later try to sell you a copy of my book. <laughs> Full <is>. disclosure. <laughs> There's my book, the podcast blog and new media producers legal survival guide. So, um, um, so that's sort of the, the the beginning of that little funnel, but it is a useful thing and you can opt out if you don't want to get that stuff. That's fine with me. I want everybody to use this release at podcastrelease.com. Okay. Now to answer your question. Yes. Contract is really just another word for agreement or deal or understanding. Okay. So it is possible to make a contract without doing it in writing. The, the downside is then how do you prove what the contract really was about? So that's why it's best to have things in writing. But in the context of the, the release, you could have them record as you start the recording. Hey, you know, you understand that I'm going to record this and you are okay with me using it in any and all media throughout the universe in perpetuity uh, without any compensation and that you have no other claims against me. And then if they say, yes, okay, we're good to go. And by the way, you do have such permission from me, Sonny, for this recording. <laughs> um, so, um, so you know that that makes a contract. There, there is an agreement there, and there's some evidence of it. But still, the formality of getting something in writing is important because it conveys some solemnity of the transaction. So, I like to have a sort of form. And you know, I'm a lawyer; I've got a vested interest in this, but. I like that there is some formality to these things by sitting down and writing it out. That said, bullet points do the job. If the parties agree to the bullets, assuming that they cover all the important terms, you know, the who, the what, the where, the when, the how, the why, the how much, and, you know, those kinds of things, you've got a contract. Yeah. It may even be a series of emails back and forth that add up to evidence of the contract. But again, the formality, the solemnity of having a piece of paper printed out that everybody signs in nice blue ink, you know, that everybody remembers that moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we signed a contract. And that's useful sometimes just heading off the dispute at the very beginning of things. Yeah. Have emails ever been used in court cases to prove, okay, the legitimacy? And uh, that's not really what I meant in that, you know, you're taking that out of context. We had an email exchange where we talked about that. Can emails be used to support? Absolutely. Okay, that's good to know. In fact, in, in, in litigation, very often one of the first things that happens is, you know, the parties file their suit and, and the answer to the, to the lawsuit. And then the, the parties will say, preserve all the evidence, including hard drives, don't delete any files, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, for that, that, that can be really important that your email is archived so that you can use it for proof. And so the other side can access your email too. So, that yeah. other side of that is the cautionary tale. Be a little careful about what you put in writing. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the format of, of these contracts, because especially when we're talking about release forms or we're having guests on our shows every week or however often we're recording and releasing episodes, 
can a digital form like something through Google Forms work if they don't actually have the signature? You know, I know there's online sources, you know, that allow you to do it a little bit more elaborately, but there's fees that are involved with that. I'm thinking about the average everyday podcaster is going, hey, I just started a show. I'm just getting my feet wet. I'm just trying to protect myself and I don't have a lot of money to invest. If you've got a form on a website that has a checkbox saying, yes, I agree. And then they type their name or something like that so that there's a record and that that form actually outputs something that you can keep, you know, whether it's a, just an email to the owner of the website that says this person filled out this form, here's a copy. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that satisfies, well, it, it, it would be satisfactory evidence that there's an agreement and what the agreement was about. You, the whole idea is that the parties have manifested their intention to be bound to these terms. And so, yeah, you could do a web form. Uh, I personally have used a gravity forms plugin on my WordPress site okay. to accomplish this. Um, you can even have it send a PDF of the, of the signed document to both parties if you wanted to. Um, yes, a, a click wrap, checking the box and, and typing your email address, those things do work as well. Okay. Again, you want to make sure that the wording of the thing is, is done right and you can grab my, my template and, <laughs> and plug yeah. it in. And giving a verbal consent, like I used to do this too, we would have a lot of people call in via Skype or, you know, whatever. And I would start recording early and I would go through a series of, of checklists, basically state your name, what's today's date, you know, you're being recorded. Can you please state that, you know, you're being recorded and you give my company's name is new mommy media. So you yeah. give new mommy media the rights to use a recording for purposes. You know, you're not getting paid. It was like five questions. Yeah, um, that's great. I mean, especially if you have sort of a template or a rubric for that conversation every time, Yes. what happens is the podcaster or whoever it is, is, is doing that is doing it sort of off the top of their head and doesn't have that checklist. Yeah. So they get to ask one of the questions or they word it inverted or something like that. And then that one doesn't have the right words. You know, irrevocable is an important word in this question because consent when given can also be revoked. So we want to make sure that it's a permanent consent. Okay. So you don't end up having to take down episodes later on or, or go back and edit things and, you know, a year later. Does one have more weight in a court system than the other? Because I'm thinking about going back to my specific case, um, the, the, guests that had a problem with how our content changed, specifically with an advertiser we brought on. They had a problem with an advertiser we brought on. Still family friendly, still followed all of the rules in my mind. It's not like I brought on a casino, okay? Um, but she didn't like that and she wanted her content to be removed. I had her on, on tape, so to speak, tape. Yeah. Uh, saying, giving me that permission. Um, but for me, and this is the other side of it, even though you're in the right, mm -hmm. okay, I'm still faced with a lawsuit of someone that wants 60,000 plus dollars for me. What does that mean for my family? What does that mean for all that kind of stuff? Right? So. Yeah. I mean, you know, a paper contract with blue ink signatures is, and it doesn't have to be blue. I'm just sort of using that as an example. So it's clear that it's separate. It wasn't printed by the printer. Right. Um, that is sort of considered the the most reliable evidence. There's right. something called the best evidence rule. You know, one piece of paper with both piece, people's signatures on it is always going to be viewed better than five emails that when you take them in, you know, in combination, oh yeah, it looks like there's an agreement. But, you know, and that's just a matter of how hard it is to prove. Um, uh, so, so best case scenario is the is the written. The oral release on recording um, you know, it, it, the one problem is you might not say it right every single time. Mm -hmm. The other is that you've got to sort of get to the point where a judge is willing to listen to that and say, yes, we have, we have an agreement on these mm. things. And everybody gets to parse it their way and those kinds of things. The document is just easier to work from. Um, and so that's what I would favor, but okay. uh, belt and suspenders is always a good idea. Okay. Um, so let's move on talking more about content, personal rights, uh, defamation, uh, right of publicity. A lot of us are, especially, I guess, I don't know if this applies more if you have a more of a news type show, but, uh, for example, in one of my shows, um, we would talk about headlines of, uh, you know, 
parenting type headlines. Yeah. And we would talk about things in the media and people gave their opinion. And, and a lot of times I'd be like, oh, they just said they totally hated a Kardashian. Is that a bad thing? Um, <laughs> I think most of us would say, no, it's not a bad thing, but I digress. Um, at what point, <laughs> like, what do we have to keep in mind when it comes to all of that and what we say? I mean, where does free speech, you yeah. know, where's the line there? And that's really what this all comes down to is questions of free speech versus personal rights. You know, we have rights of privacy, uh, especially if you're not a public figure. You have a right, a right not to have people intruding into your space and, and creating false impressions about you and using your name and likeness in a commercial way without your permission. And, uh, oh, there's one, there's a fourth one in the privacy space. And then there's this right of publicity, which is the right, again, not to have somebody use your, your name or likeness or the sound of your voice sometimes as a commercial, um, uh, commercial thing without your permission. And then there's also the right not to have people tell lies about you. You know, that's the defamation, libel and slander. Um, uh, just to clarify that, libel is the spoken or, uh, excuse me, the recorded or printed or, or broadcast version of a defamation and slander is the spoken, you know, if we're sitting in a small room and I say something about you um, just to a smaller group of people or whatever, that's slander. Okay. So we're talking about libel in the case of podcasting. Um, and that is, you know, when there's a false statement made about a person that injures their reputation somehow and causes them, you know, harm uh, and damage, usually measured in money damages. Uh, so the situation with the somebody expressing an opinion, well, an opinion isn't a fact. Right. So it's not a false statement. It is a it is my opinion that she's not a good actor or she's a terrible person or whatever. Mm -hmm. As long as I'm not getting into too much factual detail about why I think that, I'm not making a factual statement. I'm making, I'm expressing an opinion. So that's protected. Likewise, anything that's actually true is protected. So, um, um, and it has to be false and harmful. So we had a case not long ago where some media was reporting some stuff about Richard Simmons Yes, that's right. Gender or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, just recently, the court said, you know what? That alone is not harmful to reputation. Nowadays, transgender is not something people need to be ashamed about. So we're not going to treat this as defamation. Yeah. Sure, I agree 100% with that analysis, but that seems to be the law right now. Um, on the privacy side, um, you know, again, that's what these releases are about, is saying, I'm not going to sue you for using my name and, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and, uh, and what if you're talking about someone that's not there though? Like, I, I mean, I've seen this happen maybe more so on the blogging mm -hmm. side, but I'm sure it's, it's coming over to podcasting as well, where uh, bloggers talk about an experience they had, or even on social media, talking about something at work, you know, and it kind of takes off yeah. and that's supposed to be more personal kind of stuff. And suddenly their dirty laundry is everywhere. Like, yeah. So and that was the fourth one of the, of the privacy torts was the uh, public disclosure of private material, private facts, basically. Okay. So it's true information, but it's embarrassing and I don't want it out there. The fact that I have to use this particular medicine or, you know, uh, or uh, uh, who knows, you know, my sexual preference or something like that. Sure. Um, that's my business. It's not something I want shared unless I've already sort of put it out there. So if it's a private fact. Anyway, so the, the, the caveat is don't talk trash about people on your show. And I mean, if that's the nature of your show, then you need to get some legal advice about where the boundaries really are. But the general rule is if you're not lying about people and you're not talking about their private stuff and, and you know, outing them or making it public, you should be okay. okay. Um, it's when you start to get into that falsity or, or creating that false impression um, that you get into a situation. Also, by the way, in the, in the context of comedy, Nobody takes that seriously as fact, right? So you don't get into this this issue very often. Okay. But uh, yeah. So, you know, be nice. Do, follow the golden rule. <laughs> <laughs> Some podcasts out there, like you said, though, are the exact opposite. You know, they exist to yeah. kind of talk about this kind of stuff. And so they, they well, may want to seek some additional legal help. If, and, if and Yeah. And one other thing I want to just point out here is that, you know, I, I'm thinking of a few particular radio shows that, are, you know, the shock jocks, the ones who yeah. really do talk trash about everybody. Yeah. Keep in mind that podcasting is a is a you know a permanent recording that can be downloaded in re, you know later in time whereas a radio broadcast is essentially ephemeral it goes out there there is a recording but it goes out there and then it probably isn't um that accessible later in time yeah. um although that's changing nowadays anyway so things are treated a little bit differently the the scope of damages can be much bigger when 
when it's not, it, it was out there, it was three seconds, it's gone, it's never going to happen again. Yeah. Whereas it's a recording, it's going to be there and thousands and thousands of people are downloading it every month. Right, right. So podcasters may even be at a little bit more of a risk because our content is yeah. evergreen or whatever, and it's out there for people to consume at any time. Yeah. And yeah. that's another thing, with, back to the copyright stuff. Radio has special deals that allow them to broadcast music without having to check with the owners of the music first. Right. That does not apply to podcasts. And they pay a lot of money for that too, yeah. <laughs> to be able to access all of that mm -hmm. content. Okay, uh, we had a question, um, and this kind of brings in the whole journalism factor to wow. podcasting, but I still wanted to address it. And that is when a guest um, asks you if something is on the record, off the record. And then to take it one step further, it, let's say we're having a conversation. I'm like, oh yeah, Gordon, can you take that part out? Or maybe it's after recording. Can you take that part out? I don't like the way I sounded in that. And you're like, no, that was actually the best part of the show. Like what, what issues can we get into here? What do we need to know about? Let's start with on the record, off the record. Okay. Well, first of all, this is one other one of those great reasons why having a signed release that says you understand that we're recording this and we're going to use it. Yeah. So that there can be, you know, um, because you don't want to get into that situation of having to do an edit just to satisfy your guest in order to publish your episode. It's nice to be able to do that if it makes sense to do that but you don't want to be obliged to. So on the record, off the record. So this is a, uh, and you're the journalist, I'm the lawyer. Um, you know, historically, in order to protect relationships with sources, journalists would agree that if the source wanted something to be said off the record, just as background, uh, or just, you know, to, to sort of inform the context of a conversation, they would agree not to report who said it and what was said. And that would be off the record. Mm -hmm. And then on the record is, yes, you can, you can give attribution for this quote, this statement, this fact or whatever, um, you know, I'm, I'll stand behind it. And it is not a legal obligation. Um, although I, I, you could argue that there's a contract once, once they say, is this off the record? And you say, yes, then you have a, a, an oral agreement to keep that part of it off the record. Right. Um, in, the, in the context of a podcast, though, if you press the record button on your device or your computer or whatever, and you, and you, you should say, I'm recording now, Yeah. here we go, um, and maybe even a, count, a countdown or something, then, then they should understand that they are on the record, and that's, and that's the end of it. So I think that it's one of those things where if you're doing a pre-interview or preliminaries and you, you're willing to just say, yeah, just give me this as background, great, go ahead and be off the record. Mm -hmm. But once you start recording... Um, if somebody says, well, off the record, that means you're going to have to edit that episode, you know? Right. That, right. That and one of the things I do in my show, when I do interview people is I say, we don't edit the show. Once we start recording, it's, it's a train on the tracks going down the hill <laughs> and we're not stopping until the end. Right. Uh, right. Unless there's a major technical glitch or something like that. So the, the, the guests should understand this is yeah. on the record. It makes sense to be transparent about that. All right, let's talk a little bit about advertising, endorsements, affiliates, things like that. We have a responsibility as podcasters to inform our audience when we're including these in our show. What do we need to know overall? Because this is actually a little bit of new information as we were preparing for today's webinar. You shared some stuff with me. I'm like, wow, I guess I didn't realize that that's what you had to do. What do we need to know here? Well, there's a couple of, of distinctions that need to be made. One is that, you know, when you have a sponsor and you, you say, okay, the show is sponsored by, you know, Nabisco and then you play an ad, it's pretty obvious that you're playing a commercial and you've even sort of led into it with that introduction. Right. Um, when you're reading, when it's the host reading the copy, it may be less obvious that there's, that we went from program content to sponsored content. And so we want to do a, something, whatever it might be, that will convey that information that we're switching. Now it's a commercial message. So maybe a little music bumper or just a sound effect, a ding dong or, you know, whatever. Yeah. It sort of says, okay, something different's happening now. Okay. Um, on my show yesterday, I just said to my co-host, why don't you read the ad copy today? And then she read it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was very obvious to the audience that that's what was happening. Um, and I think that's important. Um, uh, partly just as an etiquette thing, but but also there is a government agency that regulates advertising and uh, commercial messages. Uh, it's called the Fair, the Fair Trade Commission, FTC. Mm -hmm. now, this comes into play, and it's even more important when we're doing um, like affiliate ads. Yeah. You know, a lot of podcasters will um, have an Amazon uh, affiliates relationship, or they'll have a deal with Audible.com or something like that, and they will. 
um, talk about a particular book or a product and then say, we've got a link in the show notes to the thing I'm talking about, head on over there and buy it. Mm. That's a situation where the FTC says the audience needs to be told that you're making money. You're making some money from it. Yeah. We've all, we've all heard these messages and there's a reason that they happen. Again, it's transparency about that. So anytime there's an endorsement of a product or something like that, when you've, when you're either getting paid by the endorser or um, by the product, excuse me, or you're getting paid if a transaction happens, you need to say so. And, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways of saying it. There's no one formula, but merely saying this is an affiliate ad or we're an affiliate of Amazon isn't enough. You need to be a little more explicit about what happens in that yeah. situation. It won't cost you anything more, but a little bit of that sale will come to me. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's the way to do it. Um, and if, and if, if you're really endorsing a product because they've given it to you for free, you know, a lot of shows do unboxing or, or they'll, hey, we tried out the such and such product and, and uh, here's what I thought of it. It sounds like a product review. Right. But if the vendor of the products gave you the thing to review and you don't have to return it afterwards, mm-hmm. you need to say so to your audience. Hey, they sent us a free, a free copy of this. Um, and yeah. here's what we thought. We're I think this is a little bit tricky because... Um, especially with podcasts, I, I view podcasts as a very intimate thing. Like right? a lot of people are listening with their earbuds. It, it feels like a more one-on-one. It's very different than other forms of media. And the input that we're getting from advertisers is we want this to be seamless. You know, it is supposed to, you know, radio and even in a lot of podcasts, I have commercial breaks built into my show. They're dynamic ads. They sound more like radio spots. I don't necessarily do host red ads, but a lot of advertisers want that where it's very, very seamless. And I feel like this is actually blurring the lines more um, and they want testimonials. So we're going to send you the product in advance and we want you to test it out and we want you to say the good things about it and how you use it with your kids. Um, are, are we blurring the lines? Is it just me or is saying again, like you said, off the top, listen, you know, this is a sponsor, you know, they help us pay for the show. We'd love for you to check them out. We got a chance to review the product or test it out a little bit, but here are some of the things we like. Is it, is it that does that solve the problem there or um is yeah, it, the, yeah the blurring of the lines that you talked about is the bad thing that's what the ftc wants us to protect against right we want our audience to understand you know it's just about transparency uh we're getting paid for saying this next thing <laughs> which which is like the exact opposite of what they want they want right. you to be like as seamless um, as possible but, but and now a word from our sponsor yeah you know it conveys the same information in a you know, less obtrusive way, I guess. you can Okay. Say. Anybody who really thinks about it critically will realize, oh, that means they're getting paid for saying this thing. But uh, so that's the thing. And, and we should also distinguish between a sponsor and an affiliate situation. A lot of people will say, our show is brought to you by, you know, this product. Yeah. When in fact, the, what it is, is it's a, an affiliate relationship. They only get paid if they get you to click on that button or, or go to that website or whatever. So the FTC says that's not really kosher. You're supposed to. Oh, that's interesting to too. Relationship. But, okay. you know, the real thing is that the sponsors need to understand that they're the ones that are going to be really on the hook if they're, if the lines are too blurry. Right. Because, you know, after all that's that they're the, they're the deeper pocket that the government would go after with a fine. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So I think that it's important to protect them from that by, including this message. Hey, we're brought to you by, or they sent us this free copy or this free baby stroller for us to check out. And here's the, here's the good, here's the bad, here's the ugly about it. Um, you know, thanks again to the stroller company for sending it over. We really appreciate it. Right. And, um, you know, and so on. If it's not a gift, if you're going to expect it to return it, then there's less, you're just reviewing and they just, as a convenience, gave you a copy to review. Right. So, um, just being honest with your audience about that. And let's face it, if you're on the receiving end of that message, wouldn't you want to know that the show I'm listening to just got a $500 baby carriage Yeah. Uh, for free just in order so they review it and give us a positive message about it? I would want to know that before I go spend 500 bucks on that thing. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That's a good way to look at it. Like, what would I want to know as a listener? And then 
do unto others as you would have done unto you, right? Rule, there we go. Golden rule. We're back to the golden rule. Okay, we only have a few minutes, but I did want to briefly talk about uh, what's going on in the EU, how that impacts us as far as marketing and, and promoting our shows, and, and a little bit about privacy policy. So I'm going to let you take this because you know okay. a lot more about it than me. So we are all starting to hear online about this thing called GDPR. It stands for General Data Protection Regulation, and it goes into effect. Actually, I heard a uh, the first time I heard a story on the mainstream radio news this morning about GDPR going into effect on May 25th this year. So just about a month away from when we're recording this. The, uh, the basic, well, the rules are that if you are collecting data about people who reside in the, in the EU, whether it's customer data or just gathering an email address, subscribers, those kinds of things. If you have any data that can be used to identify the specific person, that data is subject to these new rules, whether you are in the EU or not. So it does apply to us Americans, um, assuming we do any real business with, you know, or, or any contact with the EU. So the, there's a whole raft of things. The, the bottom line is don't panic about this. It's not hard to comply. It's just sort of complex to get your head around. One of the things that you have to do is make sure that your basis for collecting and using the data is documented, that you have a legal basis for that. Most of the time that's consent or that, you know, you need the data in order to comply with some kind of a transaction. If you're selling a product, you need to know where to ship it, <laughs> you know, that kind right. of thing and who your customer is. But you then can't use that data for other purposes, like sending a newsletter or sending ads for a different product without the consent of the person who's given the, given the data. So getting that consent is sort of the tricky wicket here. And um, um, what we're going to start seeing more on the, on the sign-up boxes is check boxes. Yes, you may use this to send me ads. Yes, you may use this to send me other information about your products and services, you know, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, for, for those of us that do email lists, uh, the way we go about uh, essentially bribing people to give us their email address is going to change a little bit because under these new rules, apparently you're not allowed to require them to check the yes, send me other information box in order to access the, the thing. So um, you're giving the freebie away without even getting the email address for future use. Um, so we're, we're having to, you know, revamp things. I created a, a, an online resource. It's free. Another one of my lead magnets. Uh, is a, a short uh, recording video about how to use the GDPR, GDPR for the rest of us, basically. It's at firemark.com slash free GDPR. And it's part of a larger course I've created for online digital entrepreneurs uh, that's coming soon. But uh, again, so this gets you onto the mailing list for that product. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, so when, you buy, when, you, when you sign up to get this thing, that's what's going to happen. Okay. Now, um, uh, so don't panic about this. The, complaint, the other component of this law is the right to be forgotten so that the data can't be retained forever. You have to, if you collect somebody's email address because you're going to deliver a free report and a newsletter, if you're not doing the newsletter again, you've got to delete their information. And if they ask you to delete their information, it has to be not just unsubscribed, but deleted. So... Um, yeah, so there are some new rules, and uh, we're all making, our, you know, making our way and figuring out what's exactly involved. It's going to involve changing our privacy policies a little bit to comply with that. But that's all good business anyway. The, uh, you know, privacy is becoming a bigger and bigger concern worldwide. We had the uh, the Facebook, Facebook. Cambridge, yeah. Cambridge Analytica thing yeah. uh, here and that applied to worldwide. So it, it's just good business to be respectful of our customers and our subscribers' privacy and not expose them to getting a lot of unwanted junk stuff from us or from anybody else. Now, how does this, you know, the stuff that the EU is doing is, is one thing. Um, as far as websites, because a lot of our podcasters, you know, have their own website. Yeah. Um, I remember you taking a look at even the Parents on Demand website and you're like, okay, where's your terms of use? Where, you know, where's your privacy? Are those, you know, I'm trying to figure out for people that are, are just kind of starting out, are those two things that you would say pretty much every website needs to have those two things? Am I missing anything? Yes. A, a, a terms of service is basically the contract between you and the visitor 
on the page. And that um, basically says, here's what you may do when you visit the page. Here's what you may not do with the content on the page or, or what, you know, and here's what's expected and here's where we're located and, and why, you know, you, yeah. So terms of service is important. And then the privacy policy. And that's what, again, we need to adapt and, and be compliant with GDPR and any new laws that come into effect as well. So that is also part of the contract you make with your users. I'm collecting this data. And you have to be careful about this. You know, if, you're, if your website system is collecting, uh, is dropping cookies on people's uh, browsers, you need to tell them this cookie is being deposited and here's what we do with the information the cookie sends back to us. We are collecting information for Google Analytics. Here's what we do with that information. And you need to be explaining what we collect, why we collect it, how long we keep it, and um, and what what it will be used for and what it won't be used for. Right. Yeah. And a lot of those I know on our website we have them as part of the bottom navigation, so it doesn't have to be super obtrusive on your site. Well, um, and th there are. Oh, go ahead. Under GDPR, the the basics of the you know the fundamentals of who of what we collect and why and what we do with it. That does need to be more obvious. Yes. So, um, it's not okay just to link to a privacy policy. So. Right. Right. Um, for those two, there, I think there's templates and stuff online. I've been, you know, on a couple of different sites where you just kind of fill out some information. Are those pretty good to use for people that are just kind of starting out? I know you can't yeah, vouch I mean, for everything out there. But it actually does reflect what you're really doing. Okay. You know, oftentimes you may not even know what you, you the, the point is you need to investigate what it is your system is doing. If you have a web designer who builds, builds something for you and doesn't, and you don't realize that it's collecting data or that you're yeah. doing analytics, you want to make sure you know. And so it does make sense to poke your nose in there and figure it out. Okay. Well, Garden, thank you so much for being with us today. We got through all of our stuff. I can't believe it. It's I know we didn't. Yet. I know, right? Well, I know we didn't dive too deep into everything and you guys may have some more questions out there. Uh, no questions came in though. So I think we can wrap this up. There were two resources that we mentioned. Can you go ahead and give those uh, URLs again? I'll put it up on the screen for everyone. Well, I'm going to give you a few. First of all, almost everything that I do and have is up at my sort of general website at gordonfiremark.com, www.gordonfiremark.com. Uh, but the free GDPR thing is uh, at firemark.com slash GDPR free. And the, uh, the release form is podcastrelease.com. And if you don't mind, I'll plug the book one more time also. Sure. Podcast blog and new media producers legal survival guide is at podcastlawbook.com. Now, is that a, that's a downloadable too? It's an ebook. Yeah, it's an e I have a few printed copies, but, but it's mainly an ebook. Yep. I have it. I have it. I downloaded awesome. it. I use it. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I thought that was an ebook. Um, and then how can people follow you if they just want to get, you know, some good stuff, you know, Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. Yeah. On Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, G Firemark is the handle. Easy to find me. Podcast is entertainmentlawupdate.com. And um, like I said, uh, www.gordonfiremark.com will sort of the showcase for all the various things that I have out in the marketplace. Awesome. Well, Gordon, again, thank you so much for being with us. This was very helpful to roll through everything and get the wheels turning a little bit. And I know we may have some questions come in later, but I appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.